our piece. We feel like um, that's the topic that we're going to be talking about. So that's why uh, we're doing that. Um, first of all, honored. Absolutely honored. Incredible. Um, you know, my experience with you and with the kind of ideas that you present started in high school when I saw a video called Manufacturing Consent in my sociology class. And uh, I was literally taken back, just uh, completely kind of started things anew for me in terms of thinking about um, systems of governance and um, the way that you presented it as uh, a kind of uh, misinformation. Um, and then, you know, later on, uh, going to Emily Carr University, you know, we're looking at Masumi and Deleuze and Guattari and then, of course, Foucault. And so I just YouTube Foucault and I found this debate with you and him uh, from some time ago and was just completely taken back. <laughs> I mean, first of all, the uh, it was a very intense debate and I think I've watched it a hundred times. Um, I have to tell you, there's uh, what the postmodernists <coughs> like to call a subtext, which you didn't see. But uh, the uh, Front's elders, the moderator of the debate, it was a <coughs> it was a Dutch anarchist, and that was a period when the Dutch anarchists were carrying out uh, quite amusing actions to try to you know épater le bourgeois to sort of uh, anger everyone. Like for example, uh, lacing, uh, going to fancy uh, horse shows with uh, elegant burgers and putting LSD in the horses. Uh, food, so they'd start to prance it around. Oh, wow. Anyway, Franz, uh, Foucault is completely bald, and on the way to the studio, Franz stopped at his apartment, and he came down carrying a bright red wig, and throughout the whole debate, he had this bright red wig on his lap, and he kept nudging Foucault, saying, put it on, put it on. Uh, <laughs> we were both trying to keep from laughing. <laughs> And these are the things you don't see uh, on the televised interview, of course. Well, probably not. If you look carefully, you might see a yeah, yeah. Well, sort of what I was interested with that regard was um, you have an acclaimed uh, critique of the media and the, you know, general uh, industrial complex as it stands. And I was wondering, what are the links between some of the uh, challenges that you presented to Foucault and your modern criticism of uh, the media and so on? Well, Foucault's uh, position, uh, exactly what he believes, I don't know, but his official position is that uh, uh, there's no... <clears throat> issues of right and wrong, just questions of power. So if you listen to the discussion, he, uh, towards the end, when he was in a kind of a Maoist phase at that time, when you, uh, the issue came up about, say, proletarian revolution, and uh, I think I asked him, well, would you support it even if it was wrong? He said, there is no such issue, it's just I'm on the side of the the work class, of course, I'd support it, whatever comes out. You know. uh, no, as f uh, with regard to the media, from his point of view, at least as I understood it, there cannot be any critique. They have power. Uh, they're part of the corporate system. They're supporting the corporate system. That's their job. Uh, so you can describe it, but there's nothing to criticize about it. There's no sense that there ought to be some other duty and responsibility against which you can evaluate what they're in fact doing. Now you could say the same about Goldman Sachs, like they just gave themselves uh, 17 and a half billion dollars of uh, compensation after having tanked the economy and being bailed out by the taxpayer. Well, you know, there's, a, there's an ethical point of view from which you can criticize that, but if you don't accept that there are ethical standards independent of particular power structures, there's nothing to criticize. Why shouldn't they rip off the public? Truthfully. And so I guess if we're looking at it from that perspective and just thinking about it in terms of the vehicle of delivery, um, you know, you've got Anonymous, the hacker group, you get WikiLeaks now, um, you've got basically what amounts to a revolution started by social media uh, and the like, uh, the internet and so on. So how do those structures then completely flip the whole thing on its uh, back? Well, they have a 
mixed effect. Um, the internet, um, as you probably know, was developed right around here under the military. It was in the hands of the military for decades, then National Science Foundation, then privatized. And it's a, it's a, it's a powerful instrument, but, a, but like other technology, it has a, you know, a good side and a bad side. Uh, it depends how it's used. I mean, it's a tremendous tool uh, for uh, research, for interaction, for uh, 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 undercutting uh, concentrated authority. It's also a tech tech. It's an instrument of indoctrination. Uh, so, for example, if you if you want to become a biologist, uh, uh, and I was you asked me for advice, I wouldn't say go into the Harvard Biology Library and read everything. That's not the way to become a biologist. But when people approach the internet, that's essentially the way they're approaching it. It's just a vast store of uh, uh, information, disinformation, uh, uh, sense, nonsense. Unless you have some framework for inquiry and investigation, it's either meaningless or worse. And in fact, it ends up being a, often a kind of a cult generator for people who don't have a a serious framework for inquiry. Uh, if somebody wants to be a biologist, uh, it's not enough just to walk into the Harvard Biology Library. You have to know what you're looking for. Where do you find out what you're looking for? Well, that comes from interaction, study, uh, 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 depth of inquiry, looking at the tradition, and so on and so forth. If that's lacking, then the uh, 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 the library, or more generally the internet, can just be a way of misleading people. Oh, so it's got both, both aspects. And the same is true of the social networking. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is what I ask you next. Was this I mean, it can be used effectively, as it was in Tucker Square. It can be used uh, at the other extreme. I saw an article uh, recently about a new disease that's developing among uh, teenage girls sleeplessness because they uh, sleep holding their cell phones or whatever they are uh, just in case at 3 a.m. Uh, somebody will call and say you know I just had a sandwich and they don't want to miss that you know because it's too important I can relate to that you can relate to that <laughs> well, I'll tell you a story about that I, I have a friend who's uh, was a bombing pilot in the, during the Vietnam War and he was bombing uh, northern Laos, mm -hmm. which was one of the real horror stories of the war. It was kind of like a Stone Age society. They were wiping it out, mainly because they had the airplanes and they didn't know what to do with them. Uh, after the war, he sort of thought about what he'd been doing. He had pangs of conscience. Anyway, he devoted the rest of his life to trying, has devoted it, to trying to uh, rebuild northern Laos. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it is really a Stone Age community, scattered, uh, you know, nothing. You know. One of the, uh, he managed to get a philanthropist to put up um, cell, tone, cell phone towers, and he got someone else to distribute cell, cell phones. To, these are people who have you know, almost nothing. You know. I asked him, well, what do they do with them? He said, well, the first thing that happened was that the teenage girls started talking to each other. <laughs> And then uh, other people sort of got the idea and somebody would call his friend in the next village. Wow, so that's a natural function. So I think it's genetic.